try to be short and concise. Uh, thank I'm Holby, member of the this. Rules Committee. For the record, I'm Jeff Reardon, State Representative, District 48. And uh, I thank you so much for hearing this. I know how busy you are. And uh, anyway, um, our proposal is to put w people to work now and to relieve Portland area congestion by re redirecting funding from the Rose Quarter to the I-205 Abernethy Bridge project. Nearly three years after passage of House Bill 2017, it has become clear that prioritization should be reversed. House Bill 4017 will redirect funding to the shovel-ready I-205 Abernethy Bridge project while thoughtfully crafting a solution for the Rose Quarter with an eye toward the future. Let me explain. There are two major impediments to the north-south flow of traffic on the interstate freeways in Region 1. Of the two, the Rose Quarter Project and I-5 was chosen to be funded, while the Abernathy Bridge was not. Transportation choke point that is the Rose Quarter must be designed and built someday. I live in Portland, and I get that. Considering the project has been under development for years and that significant major challenges still remain, there's little reason to believe that a thoughtful design that serves our community will do, be developed anytime soon. There are questions about whether the proposed Rose Quarter project will actually improve the movement of cars and trucks through the city. To answer that question, there needs to be answers to questions about a second choke point that's only a few miles north on I-5. <coughs> The Rose Quarter project and its ability to improve north-south traffic flow is tied to the Columbia River Crossing project, which suffered through a lengthy, expensive, and failed effort a few years ago. <clears throat> There's more. Since Rose Quarter project selection in 2017, the cost to complete has risen from $500 million um, to $795 million. Also, certainly remained uh, uncertainty remains about the additional work needed to redevelop the Albina neighborhood, which was ravaged during the construction of I-5 in the 1960s. In addition, many community members have strong objections to any improvements that favor freeways over other forms of transportation. There are even unanswered questions about capping the freeway, which could add hundreds of millions of dollars to. I'll say again, all this Rose Quarter project work needs to be done. There's just a lot of public process and design work that remains. However, a second north-south freeway in the same Region 1, I-205, has severe congestion at the Abernethy Bridge and is likely to fail in an earthquake. Both I-5 and I-205 have massive daily backups that delay cars and freight trucks, but only one has broad community support that is deemed to be shovel-ready. Only the I-205 project would put people to work in 2022 to improve seismic safety of a heavily traveled bridge and improve throughput of the freeway and it has one of the best bridges over the columbia already and hopefully you're about at the end of your presentation transportation must be viewed regionally providing improvements on i-205 would prepare the region for added congestion on i-5 that surely will result during that rose quarter project and prioritizing i-205 allows time for the community to develop a thoughtful solution um, we've got broad community support the Clackamas Caucus sent a letter to this uh, to you with uh, 14 signatures on it. Bipartisan group. We advocate strongly for 14, 40, 17. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Holby, Vice Chair Smith Warner, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Meek, uh, House District 40 representative, and I'm here in support of House Bill 4017. And just a little history of the House Bill 2017, up until the last two weeks of the session, the I-205 project, including all the way to expansion to Stafford Road, was in the bill. But uh, through either political will or, or just uh, lobbying, strong lobbying, we had to detract and remove it from the bill. And uh, there is still very wide uh, when that tour was occurring in 2016 and 17, uh, every uh, community around the state, including Eastern Oregon and Southern Oregon, thought that the I-205 project and the expansion of it was a, a, necess a, a very necessary uh, part of our uh, freight shipment <coughs> and, and the habitability of our state. So fast forward to 2020 here, and uh, it looks like, uh, as we all have uh, experienced, Sometimes a bill needs a little more work, and uh, and what I'm looking at now is that the Rose Quarter project still needs work, and it is not ready. It's not shovel ready. There is a lot of political upheaval. There's not a lot of planning and decision making that needs to be done. 
our project here in Abernathy Bridge and in Clackamas County is ready to go. We have the funding, we have the planning, we have the, everything is ready to go, shovel ready. And so I'm advocating in, to support this project. Our constituents, our business owners, our public, our, our you know, freight shippers, they all are relying on us to make good decisions and prioritize our dollars based on good projects that are ready to go. I'm advocating Clackamas County, the state of Oregon, it was relying on this infrastructure improvement, and not only for the resiliency issues, but for just the whole freight issues. I, um, I urge your support for House Bill 4017. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holvey, Vice Chair. Smith Warner, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to wait, or can no. I keep going? All right, we're providing this time oh, no. to discuss the Dash One Amendment. Can you move away from that microphone a little bit? That, sorry, <laughs> I want to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No more. Good. <laughs> Proceed. I've been excited Your for clock this. Your just started ticking. <laughs> I think we all know I that. Can't tell. The Dash 1 Amendment, the needs of my district, and the most responsible use of transportation dollars. For the record, my name is Rachel Prusak. I'm the uh, representative for House District 37. I want to start by acknowledging the work of Representative um, McEwen, Representative McLean, Senator Beyer, and Senator Johnson for crafting a transportation package three years ago. I'm advocating for funding to address the Abernathy Bridge for several reasons. It is not safe and needs seismic upgrades. When we eventually experience a Cascadia earthquake, the bridge will collapse bringing regional instability and hindering our emergency response effort for the entire region. According to the ODOT website, the Abernathy Bridge is, quote, vulnerable to severe damage or collapse in the event of a major earthquake. ODOT has designated I-205 as a statewide north-south lifeline route, which means it must be operational quickly if an earthquake renders other roadways unusable or impassable. It will be a critical route in getting supplies and services to the region, end quote. Frequently, there is traffic diversion due to the Abernathy bottleneck. Commuters often exit I-205 and use the residential roads of West Lynn and the Stafford area in an attempt to avoid the bottleneck. Based on ODOT's interchange traffic volume report, we have seen 260% increase in traffic re-entering the interstate at the Stafford exit. This increase represents more than 4,100 vehicles diverting through the local community roads every day, not only placing a burden on roads not constructed for this type of heavy traffic, but creating a safety risk for families who live there. It is unavoidable for the residents of my community to meet their basic needs without being impacted by the 205 congestion and its resulting diversion. Regardless of where they live, my constituents are impacted by diversion traffic. Willamette Falls Drive, Stafford Road, Highway 43 are all examples of two-lane roads that are impacted by the overcrowding from this. There are no other options for my constituents. You have all seen headlines about local concerns and increase in costs worth the delay on the Rose Quarter project, but I'm concerned many people don't know that ODOT is planning to toll the district years ahead of the rest of the region. This is a concerning plan and issue that my constituents reach out to me frequently. This past December, the Oregon Transportation Commission learned that ODOT has plans to toll Clackamas in 2023 and I-5 in 2026. Setting aside the logistical nightmares of diversion traffic to the Rose Quarter, it is fundamentally unfair to have my community singled out for tolls while the rest of the region has years before entertaining such costs. I want to make this clear. I do not support ODOT's current tolling plan. It will add to local traffic as commuters look to not only avoid gridlock, but also avoid paying a new toll. We can fix the Abernathy Bridge by being better stewards of taxpayer money. I appreciate and respect the work that went into the 2017 bill. Given the current challenges facing the Rose Quarter project, I'd like for this committee to reconsider how the money is allocated. There are real concerns that need to be addressed. I won't repeat them, they have been mentioned. From what I've seen and learned during the 2019-2020 sessions, we as a legislature need to be deliberate in our decision making. I want to improve on the hard work of the 2017 architects and realize their vision of addressing these bottleneck projects. As a nurse practitioner, I make assessments, I diagnose, and I treat. And at times, I have to reassess. And I think that uh, by me reassessing to ensure the highest quality of care for my patients, and I believe Oregon is best served with the same careful consideration, we need to get moving on what's ready and right for our communities, and that's the Abernathy Bridge I-205 bottleneck. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Representative Neron. Thank you, Chair Holvey, Vice Chair Smith Warner, and members of the committee. For the record, I am Courtney Neron, State Representative for House District 26. My colleagues here spoke with passion and urgency because the Abernathy and I-205 lane widening project are in their district. And I'm here to lend my perspective that this is a project of regional and statewide importance as well. In my district, we know the congestion issues on nearby freeways well, not the least of which is the regular I-205 backup and the bottleneck at the Abernathy Bridge, which slows down commuters and commercial drivers alike. This portion of I-205 is the last stretch of interstate in the metro region that is only two lanes in each direction. Over 100,000 vehicles use this section of I-205 each day where drivers experience five and a half hours of congestion daily and traffic backups commonly extend for five to seven miles in the two-lane portion of 205 during daily commute hours. The 205 corridor is a key interstate freight movement route that bypasses Portland's urban core. In order to maintain traffic handling capacity on at least one of the Portland-Vancouver metro area interstate highways, I believe it would be strategic to complete work on the I-205 Abernathy Bridge project prior to starting on the I-5, I-84 Rose Quarter improvements and the Oregon-Washington I-5 interstate bridge. The problems we have outlined today have made the I-205 Abernathy Bridge project a top transportation priority for cities, businesses, and workers throughout the region and the state. Many of my constituents see improvements on this road as long overdue, and our communities are enthusiastic about getting started. I see funding the project now as a responsible fiscal decision and one that will benefit Oregonians and anyone traveling through the region. Thank you for your consideration of House Bill 4017. Thank you for your testimony and your presentation on the bill. Appreciate it. Uh, up next, we're going to switch uh, up to Representative McCune, Senator Beyer, Representative McLean, and Senator Johnson. Oh, okay. Welcome this late afternoon, if you'd introduce yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, I am Lee Beyer, State Senator and Co-Chair of the Joint Transportation Committee. And uh, it's uh, interesting to be having transportation discussions in the Rules Committee rather than Transportation Committee. We actually meet in about 30 minutes uh, <coughs> to deal with transportation issues, but so be it. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> the work. Welcome fault. to the Rules Committee. <laughs> Welcome That's to our I've Rules I've been on Rules <laughs> Committee before. Uh, I appreciate the concerns that the representatives from the Clackamas County uh, expressed regarding 205. I share those concerns. I will say that when we did the 2017 bill, uh, we literally spent over five months every night working on transportation issues throughout Oregon, but particularly in the metropolitan area. Uh, <laughs> those meetings often went for a couple hours, and, and we had one work just on that area. The phasing project that we ended up with in the metro area was the recommendation of the elected leaders of the metro area as to what they thought made the best sense, I think they call that group JPAC, and, and what phasing it ought to be. The phasing of I-5 and 205, which we determined could not be done concurrently, uh, needed to be phased, and the feeling from the professionals was that the I-5 improvement needed to be done first in order not to add to congestion in the area. That was the technical expertise of the area. So I know that concern's there. Uh, one of the other things, I, I know there's a concern that people think that we're dragging our feet on 205. Uh, that is incorrect. The co-chair, my co-chair and I and other members of the committee has spent considerable time in the last full session working with ODOT administration and we pressed them many times and our order to them was go back and come back and tell us how quickly you can do Abernathy Bridge 
and the rest of the 205 project. It's not just Abernathy Bridge. Doing Abernathy Bridge by itself really doesn't solve any problem other than it gives you sounder bridge. We really need to widen it. <coughs> they came back and we pushed a lot on them. The soonest, technically, that they can be con begin construction on the Abernathy Bridge, and that has to be done first, is 2022. That is as soon as technically they can get in the ground and do that. We have a funding strategy to make that work. That strategy, I will admit, includes tolling, but tolling is not just for financing, it's also for congestion management and we will be looking at it the entire area. I will tell you from looking at other communities our size or the metro size, there hasn't been one in the United States that's done these kinds of improvements without installing some type of traffic management or tolling process. That's just the way we are. Unless, unless the federal government decides to significantly increase funding and backs up a 10 yard truck full of money, uh, we can't get there. We cannot get there. The money that people want to divert from, I will tell you from the Rose Quarter, is not sufficient to do the Abernathy Bridge project by itself. It will take more money than it will take in addition some tolling. So we will, that's just a reality of where we're at fiscally. Uh, that whole project, and some people misunderstand it from a freight mobility standpoint, the project on I-5, and there are a series, the one we're talking about tonight is Rose Quarter. That one, if you're familiar with what we did between 217 and 205 on the south end, where we put two auxiliary lanes in, that significantly improved traffic through there. In fact, it eliminated the general congestion. If we could only go a little farther south and solve the Boone Bridge in Wilsonville, we would have that one solved, but that's for another day. We need to get to that as well. The traffic- And, and you need to leave some comments for other people as well. <laughs> Excuse me? Can you, can you wrap it up here pretty shortly? <laughs> the, the traffic <laughs> impact from the auxiliary rains in Rose Quarter actually has greater potential to resolve the problem than we've seen in 217. So we think those auxiliary lanes will help congestion a lot and they will promote both inner city travel as well as freight mobility. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will stop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you being here. So. Chair Holoby, Vice Chair Smith Warner, members of the committee. My name is Caddy McHugh and I represent House District 9. And I had the, the honor and pleasure of co-chairing <clears throat> the Joint Committee on Transportation Preservation and Modernization in the 2017 session uh, with my co-chair. Uh, and Representative Smith Warner also was an important part of that team, along with my colleagues to my right who were the congestion work group. Uh, so they will speak to the details of what happened in their work group. Um, I, I just want to take a step back and put with a little bit higher level view and talk about about how long it took and how difficult it was to pass this package. We did a statewide tour um, after we failed to move the package in 2015. I think people lose sight of the fact that there was a ramp up in 2015 to this where a great deal of effort was expended as well. Um, and everywhere around the state that we went, uh, people were concerned about congestion, particularly about costs and freight. And the Rose Quarter is the biggest pinch point that we have. And part of the reason that it is sequenced first is because of that reason. And I think you'll hear some more details about that in just a minute from one of my colleagues. Um, um, after we did the tour and we sat down and started processing everything that we needed to do to get this bill passed, uh, the, the senator is correct. We met um, evenings through the entire session and in some of the people behind me who will testify will tell you how many nights they spent down here working on four work groups, congestion, preservation and maintenance, transit and multimodal forms of transportation. Um, this was a, an incredibly well done process, which has now become a model in this building for other ways to get large pieces of legislation done. So I don't want to lose sight of that either. Um, and it, it, it took um, uh, um, all of us pulling on the oar to bring forward a, a, a process that we took to, um, uh, to our voters and asked them to trust us to do something that was enormous. And it was a, it's actually a, a, a 10 year process that we went through, which is very unusual. Um, so this thing goes out for quite a ways. We made promises to people 
Um, many promises were made in many aspects of this um, that I feel very uncomfortable if we back up on. Um, this is not a regional strategy, this is a statewide strategy. And one of the things that came up from uh, the people that spoke prior is the fact that um, uh, the regionalization of this doesn't work very well. It really has to continue to remain a statewide process. The Rose Quarter can move forward right now with the work that we did. Uh, there are some political issues, but the issues of the caps and the covers and the issues of schools can be done on a parallel track with moving the Rose Quarter project forward. There's an attempt to muddy that water and we need to stay the course and move this project through as those other projects are dealt with, which they can be. And it is our hope, and we have made it very clear to the OTC and to um, um, our friends in the metro area that we stand firm behind the Rose Quarter project because that really does need to go first for all of the reasons that you're hearing. Uh, and the other thing that hasn't been touched on, I don't think strongly enough, is the sequence thing of this is critical because the Rose Quarter needs to be done, then 205, then we need to move to the Columbia River Bridge. Um, and if we don't sequence these correctly, um, we're gonna have a difficulty moving that Columbia River Bridge project. So these were done, they were carefully studied, it was done this way for a reason, and I'm really concerned if we start backing up on a process that was well-crafted, with promises that were made, and we asked our voters to trust us in raising the gas tax and their registration and title fees, which is difficult, and I think it really comes to the integrity of this body if we begin to move back on a process that was well-crafted, well done, um, uh, and that is in place for a reason. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Whoever would like to go next. Thank you. Mr. Chair and committee, I, you've heard about the process, you've heard about the, the basic goal, which is when we went around the state, they indicated to us that the number one priority was to get rid of congestion in the Portland area. I was lucky enough to be on the congestion pricing committee, and in that committee, we looked at a lot of different figures, we looked at a lot of different technical work, we looked at what is considered ADT, or the average uh, daily trips, and I wanna just give you an example example of that, the uh, average daily trips on uh, the Stafford area uh, is basically between 90,000 and 119,000. On the Rose Quarter, it's 121,400 trips. We also looked at the freight component. On the Stafford area, there's 8% that are ADTs. On the Rose Quarter, there's 12% that are ADTs, which helps keep us still vital as far as our freight, our freight and getting our business in and our, our crops and our products in and out of the state uh, to be able to deal with our west side markets. The hours of congestion on I-205 was three and a half hours a day that it was congested. In the Rose Quarter, it's 12 hours. And that has only increased since 2017. We made commitments to everyone that we were going to help on congestion. Congestion has three spokes. It has 205, it has I-5, and it has 217, and it has basically the circle that goes around Portland. We have to do it all, and we made a commitment to all three of those projects. But in that project discussion and congestion um, discussion, we also talked about the fact that if you do a mega project, that mega <coughs> project you can estimate the cost estimate the cost but you have to realize that it's not going to be built for one two three four years and so those costs are going to go up with inflation only and so we had to deal with the cost of these projects and that's how we had to scope the actual uh, size of the different uh, pieces of the the financial plan but the most important thing that we did in that congestion pricing subcommittee was talk about sequen the sequencing of those projects and specifically why one had to go before the other as you've already heard from two of the representatives up here both senators and representatives on those committees it was number one rose quarter we are not denying that as any mega project you're always going to have issues that come up but we are capable of dealing with those issues we have a transportation commission and we have others in our odot uh, groups that are dealing with those issues and we need to get that built first 
And I'm not going to belabor anything else other than to say that 205 needs to know that I will be here and I will be, you know, clawing through until we get all three of the projects done. But it does matter in what order that we do them. And I'll be quiet now. Thank you. Mr. Chair, everything has been said, just not by everybody. <laughs> for, the, for the record, my name is Bessie Johnson, and I was part of the Joint Transportation Committee that did the heavy lifting on House Bill 2017, the largest, most comprehensive investment in Oregon's transportation system. The 2017 bill was a carefully crafted and laboriously negotiated package. For those of us who worked on and voted for the bill, it was a sacrifice to go back to our districts and explain to our constituents that the three projects were in the Portland metro area. The fact that we made those explanations is testimony to the fact that we came and negotiated in good faith with an eye towards system improvements versus parochial projects. Mm -hmm. There was ample justification for us to face the wrath of our constituents as congestion in the Portland metro area hurts cheese producers in Tillamook as well as onion growers in, As in Ontario and everybody in between who has to transit the Portland metropolitan area. Any attempt to change the thoughtfully, thoroughly crafted 217 effort breaks faith with the committee disrespects the negotiators who invested literally hundreds of cumulative hours and furthers the cynicism about a deal being a deal in the Oregon legislature, even if it's memorialized in statute. Thank you. I, I appreciate your testimony and I don't think we have any questions of our legislators. We don't have any strong feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to speak? Uh, I appreciate you being here and, and voicing your opinions and giving us your information. Uh, with that, I'm going to bring up uh, some other panels um, and don't judge your two minutes based on legislators' idea what two minutes is. <laughs> so, uh, next I have Rihanna Sagdol. I'm sorry if I missed that wrong. Jim Bernard, Teresa Koloff, and Nellie DeVries. Yeah, I'm gonna probably have to start using a timer now. It didn't seem to work just <laughs> mentioning it before. So I really hate to cut people off. This is a really important issue. Um, so I'm gonna be a little bit flexible, but please try to keep it to two minutes or you know, I'll, I'll be looking for a job. So th thank you. <laughs> Uh, Chair Holvey, Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me here today and give me the time to share my thoughts on this issue. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of what I hope to be my future constituency as Clackamas County Commissioner. And I'll keep this short for the sake of brevity and most of what I wanted to say has already been said. Um, February 20th, morning rush hour commute, uh, thousands of rural Oregonians sat in the pretty much a parking lot after a semi-truck went through the medium into oncoming traffic. It took hours to clear and many were late to work. Um, and this is unfortunately the potential future for a county if tolling is allowed to pass. Um, Clackamas County currently does not have the needed infrastructure to withstand its growth uh, without expansion of existing freeways. Uh, tolling will increase traffic and cause diversion traffic to spill uh, over into neighborhoods in rural county two-lane roads. Um, I would really like to thank the hard work and efforts of uh, Representative Prusak and House Minority Leader Drazen for their wonderful bipartisan support and work um, on the Dash 1 Amendment. Um, and I urge this committee to please adopt the Dash 1s in an effort to put people to work now, uh, reduce the need for tolling, and provide appropriations for expansion and upgrades that are shovel ready and ready to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. If you just introduce yourself for the record, please. Chair Holdy, uh, Vice Chair Smith Warner, and members of the um, of the committee. I'm Teresa Kohlhoff. I'm on the Lake Oswego City Council and here to speak for Lake Oswego. I'm on all of the transportation type committees for the state, the metro, the county. 
I'm here to testify on behalf of the amendment to House yeah. Bill 4017. We wanted you to know that Lake Oswego is supportive of this reallocation. We believe that the Rose Quarter project is not ready to go, and the Abernathy Bridge and I-205 widening project is ready. It's obvious that there is a need for critical capacity and seismic upgrades. What is not obvious, of course, is the available funding. We are aware that there are public concerns about the equity and climate impacts regarding the I-5 project. What we want out of this, of course, are the concerns that we have about congestion and economic impacts, the additional costs of waiting until we had understood 2023, and the lack of quality of life for commuters. But what we need, and why I'm here, is we want and need a corridor prepared to accommodate transit alternatives, such as future bus service and a north-south lifeline to provide supplies and services to the region after a disaster. Obviously, the Abernathy Bridge is not now in a condition to withstand any such disaster. Mm -hmm. To be brief, just say that Lake Oswego is very supportive of this legislative proposal. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Holvey and members of the committee. I, for the record, am Chair Jim Bernard, Clackamas County Commission, and I'm here on behalf of support of the first uh, amendment one, number one. Um, I, I'm going to go off script a little bit. I'm also on the T2020 task force, which is the Metro's effort to look at a transportation package. And I have one, I have one great fear. Uh, I hear more and more about uh, the lack of desire to build another road. The longer we wait, that voice gets louder and louder and louder. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, uh, ODOT has invested 50 million in this project already, and they're ready to go. It's shovel ready. While in the, the Rose Quarter area still has, will have and does have a lot of opposition, the fact that it's a road at all. And then to cap it and all those other things are of great concern to me. In the past, all AOC counties supported uh, 205 project, and uh, and so did Metro. Now, my understanding is Metro is concerned about uh, support of this project. Um, this project, uh, Abernathy Bridge, I'm also, and I'm not representing them, but I'm the chair of the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization in the metro region. And this is one of the lifelines should a disaster occur in the future. So, uh, and we're ready to go on it. Uh, we've invested a lot of time and money, and uh, the federal government is also ready. Kurt Schrader met with him the other day. He was uh, uh, very sad that we weren't making this a priority. He had money. He was working on uh, uh, directing towards I-205. And uh, the other important thing to remember is that 60, 70 percent of our citizens have to leave the county to go to work, and they're using I-205. Thank you. Thank you for being here and providing your testimony. I appreciate it. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Could that be okay? Ask a question? Yeah. Why don't you wait till she's done? Oh, I thought you were. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Okay. Uh, Chair Holby, members of the committee, um, my name is Nellie DeVries. I'm here today on behalf of the Clackamas County Business Alliance. We represent various business interests and members throughout the county. And um, I just wanted to fir at first say thank you to all of the legislators that took place and participated in the 2017 passage of this massive, painstaking transportation package. I, I know that a lot of hours and energy is put into that and just want to say, you know, I really do appreciate that. Um, that being said, we have some concerns just with the holdup that has happened in the Rose Quarter area. Definitely appreciate the need for the reasons why it should be first. However, if 
you know, it's there's some question in terms of when that when some of those issues are going to be resolved. So, for those reasons, we are very supportive of taking a reallocation of those funds to um, I-205. Um, I just wanted to uh, most of what I had written down has already been said, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to state on the record that we also disagree with ODOT's tolling plans for the I-205 Abernathy Bridge. Um, first, it's our understanding that ODOT does not expect the tolling of I-205 to raise enough funds to pay for this bottleneck project. So lacking adif additional funding from, other s from another source, how will this project ultimately be funded? And secondly, um, ODOT's current tolling plans call for tolling of I-205 in 2023, followed by the I-5 Rose Quarter in 2026 or later. And from a tiny timing standpoint, this penalizes Clackamas residents and businesses who will have to pay for a toll first, excuse me, first in the region. So we suggest that more work needs to be done to refine how tolling is imposed on our region and ask that it is done in such a way that it provides fairness and a more coordinated approach with how construction of various mega projects are sequenced. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, your testimony. So did you have a quick question? A, qu a very quick question for LPRO. Um, earlier it was stated that the amount of money that would be reappropriated for the Dash 1 amendment would not cover what we would need um, for tolling. And I was just wondering, Melissa, is that is that correct? Is that 30 million enough um, or would we still need to look at tolling options? That's a question that she can't answer to you at this point. I apologize. Um, so, I mean, you can get your question and, and we'll follow up. Okay, thank you okay. so much. Uh, up next, Janet Jarvis, Waylon Buchan, and Kevin Campbell. Here, I thought you were here for judiciary issues. <laughs> Anywhere, relatively silent. I'll sit on that. Sit in order. Good evening, Mr. Chair. For the record, Jana Jarvis on behalf of the Oregon Trucking Association. Um, for all members of the committee, I'm here on, on behalf of the Oregon Trucking Association. So I just wanted to talk to you really quickly because we were very involved with the development of House Bill 2017. I'm here to give you a little short history lesson. Waylon has a couple of points as well. And um, Kevin is here to represent the motoring public, but it needs to be recognized that we represent the payers of the system. And so just keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about this. Certainly the growing congestion in the Portland region was a, is a top concern for my members. And I think the point that needs to be made here is that it was our, my members statewide. From trucking interests based in Medford to Ontario to Tillamook to Coos Bay, when we sat down with our board of directors to talk about this package, they all said fix Portland first and fix I-5 first. And the reason for that is because I-5, it addresses the economic engine of our state. With the Port of Portland there, with all the industry along I-5, the, the, the goods that move in and out of Portland go through that region. Versus I-205, which is used primarily by goods that are moving between Canada and Mexico, or Washington and California. Those are goods that, so our trucking companies that don't have to stop and deliver in Portland will take 205, but the vast bulk of the, of the goods move through the I-5 region. The other thing I wanted to mention to you as well, that the congestion has been growing exponentially in that region. When we first talked about this in 2017, the I-5 corridor was number 62 on the American Transportation Research Institute's top bottlenecks, nationwide top bottlenecks list. Last year it moved to number 28, and it just came out last week that it has moved to number 19. So it is, this problem is growing quickly. It needs to be addressed quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Holvey, members of the committee, for the record, Waylon Buchan with the Oregon Trucking Associations. Perfect handoff, Jana, because last week the American Transportation Research Institute released the top 100 bottlenecks in the U United States. You should have this or it's being handed to you now. Very cool, very colorful, very informative. It tells you on the back side that the I-5 of the Rose Quarter project has now risen to the number 19th worst bottleneck in the United States, followed by number 34, I-5 of the Columbia River. And now we are so bad southbound that we also include I-5 205 South as number 88. Things are getting worse at the Rose Quarter and it's absolutely vital that we get ahead of that. When complete, the Rose Quarter project will reduce congestion, it'll improve safety, and it'll improve freight mobility along the corridor as well as statewide. 
The legislature is taking action on all of these key corridors because House Bill 2017 was a monumental, massive transportation investment unlike the state has ever seen. It also includes structures, triggers, and a regimented system for how we outlay these projects over a decade. It includes the Joint Task Force on Mega Transportation Projects established in the bill, the Continuous Improvement Advisory Committee also established in the bill. We now have the Joint Transportation Committee to shepherd this along. But let's, let's be really clear, the consequences of diverting funding away from the Rose Quarter means that we put the brakes on that project and it essentially collapses. There is no other funding identified for that critical corridor. Alternatively, lawmakers could choose one of the other unearmarked pennies that are sitting out there that are coming in 2022 and 2024. However, those come with consequences as well. You're either gonna defer maintenance or you're going to delay projects outlined in Section 71D of that original legislation. It's important to note that regardless whatever choice the legislative body makes, I think you should adhere to a couple key principles. One, you should vet these through the proper committees, Joint Transportation as well as the Oregon Transportation Commission. We should make eyes wide open decisions and not just simply swap one half a billion dollar mega project for another and assume there are no massive consequences. And most importantly, we should an honor in the intent of the package to make sure that we deliver what we promise to the ratepayers. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Holvey, members of the committee for the record. My name is Kevin Campbell. I'm here on behalf of AAA Oregon, Idaho. Uh, we have almost 700,000 members in the state and we are the payers of the system. We were intimately involved in the negotiation around House Bill 2017. Uh, we supported the efforts of the Joint Transportation Committee as they made a tour around the state, talked to Oregonians about what the priorities should be and what their needs were. And it was probably not surprising that this I-5 Rose Quarter project statewide was a concern for Oregonians everywhere. It is widely recognized as the most significant bottleneck on I-5 between Canada and Mexico. And it has a significant safety issues, congestion of 12 hours per day uh, that uh, motorists and freight uh, haulers have to deal with. And so we have been supportive of that as part of the package that was negotiated. The legislature can always change things, but I do wanna echo the fact that these hard fought negotiated agreements uh, mean something not just for this agreement, but for future ones and the ability for people to come to the table knowing that they're reliable. Uh, we support this package as it was um, uh, adopted and we hope that it will continue to prioritize the Rose Quarter. If we step back from the Rose Quarter now, I would just say that delay is defeat. There's been significant resources put in. There are obstacles, but I believe they're going to be worked through. But I think stepping back would require us to reinvest in the future significant dollars that would simply be lost if we stepped back at this point. Uh, so uh, with that, um, Mr. Chair, I do want to, because no one has done this yet. No one has supported the underlying bill. And yet, for session after session, <laughs> uniform standards for speed bump height and markings has been largely ignored. And I would encourage this committee for the first time to give ODOT what yeah, they want. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody that appreciates me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for being here. I really appreciate your comments. Uh, up next, Elizabeth Edwards, John Rakowitz, and Randy Tucker. That's funny. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Director. Chair. Chair Holy, members of the committee, John Rakowitz with the Associated General Contractors, largest construction, uh, tra uh, commercial construction trade association in the state, here to um, uh, uh, plead and beg that you do not entertain uh, the Dash 1 amendments. Um, I'll be very short and simple. We were also deeply engaged. We sat, including with uh, the vice chair, uh, uh, hours upon hours upon hours. So sequencing was a major theme of an earlier panel, and that was fundamental. We brought contractors in to talk about sequencing. Mm -hmm. The capacity of our industry to actually deliver this work. And so there was a great deal of thought. That was on the practical side, why Rose Quarter came first and other projects were scheduled and sequenced in the manner that they were. Um, secondly, 
I was taken back that throughout the state of Oregon, Rose Quarter continued to rise to the top no matter what part of the state we were in. And uh, finally, I, I will agree with uh, members of the panel just before us. I believe that if, if this Dash 1 amendment were to be approved, I believe we would end up in the same, in a similar situation and we would see the project delayed and who knows if we would ever see it built, which in effect also has a dramatic impact on the ability to finally get at the interstate bridge crossing replacement project. So um, hopefully that was quick enough and I'll turn it over to whoever is next. Yeah. Chair Holby, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Elizabeth Edwards. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the City of Portland, and I'm here today in opposition to the Dash 1 Amendment and here to state our support for the Rose Quarter Project. I think, you know, much has been said about the importance of uh, the corridor, improvements to the corridor around freight, around safety. Um, I want to highlight something that hasn't been touched on yet, which is, you know, this is more than just one of the most important bottleneck projects on the West Coast, it's also incredibly important from the perspective of restorative justice. Uh, so the city has been working very closely with ODOT as well as the Albina Vision Trust and members of the community. And I just want to highlight that we're excited to work together on getting the right project, on getting a complete project, and getting this done. Um, when the I-5 uh, interstate project was put in, it ripped through the largest African-American community in the state. And so this project is actually about uh, our statewide commitment and shared responsibility toward uh, restorative justice there. And we can do it while we are making the improvements to the freight uh, uh, passage. And that's part of the complete project. So I wanted to highlight that because it hasn't been put on the record yet. In addition to um, all the other comments of my colleagues, it's rare that the city gets to speak uh, in arm to arm with the truckers and AAA and, and Mr. Rakowitz. So I'll <laughs> conclude my statement. Thank you. <laughs> I'll repeat that last part too. Oh, yeah. um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm Randy Tucker. I'm a legislative affairs manager for Metro. The Metro Council that also does not support the Dash 1 Amendment to House Bill 4017. While both the I-205 project and the Rose Quarter project are very important to the Metro Council, uh, this amendment just simply moving the money, the money from one to the other does nothing to really solve the funding gap in the Portland region for major freeway bottleneck projects. Metro and JPAC have long supported, have long called for <coughs> investment to relieve bottlenecks throughout the Portland region and in fact our region committed the first dollars to the project development of both of these projects uh, with $10 million of federal flexible funds in 2016. Um, we've more recently we've been working with the city of Portland, as, as Elizabeth said, uh, Multnomah County, the Albina Vision Trust, and others to ensure that investments at the Rose Quarter will achieve two key outcomes: congestion relief, but also reconnection of the of the uh, community that was divided by I-5. Um, we can't support the Dash One Amendment today for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the funding solution for I-205, which is important, should involve growing the pie, not simply taking funding from one project to pay for another. Uh, second, the diversion of funds away from the Rose Quarter project without a solid plan to backfill the resulting shortfall will further delay the improvements needed to reconnect the community that was cut in two with the, with the construction of I-5. Third, without improvements, at the, as has been said earlier, without improvements at the Rose Quarter, replacing the I-5 bridge over the Columbia River will be delayed and will fail to achieve the necessary transportation improvements that constitute the primary rationale for that project. Um, we should also note that ODOT has made significant progress on the Rose Quarter over the last several months. The OTC is moving forward quickly with the project <laughs> while maintaining their commitment to Metro and other stakeholders to lead the project with community input and clear, transparent decision making. Defunding the project at this critical stage jeopardizes the ability of multiple partners to maintain the momentum. And finally, while there's been significant publicity around the cost of the Rose Quarter project, inflation has also increased the price of the I-205 project since 2017. We don't believe this funding is sufficient to build that project in any event. So thank you for your consideration of these comments. Thank you for being here to testify. Close the public hearing on House Bill 40. I just wanted to say, thank everyone for bringing me back to that period in my life where <laughs> I spent evening after evening in a small room with Senator Betsy Johnson, Senator Brian Boquist, and Susan McLean. Thank you all. 
Good. With that. <laughs> With that, can I close the public right hearing ahead. there? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll close the public hearing on House Bill 4017. And I'm going to open a public hearing on Senate Bill 1533. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Senate Bill 1533A changes the $5,000 limit on the amount of relief that landlords may